somewhat. Uh, it's primarily a series of case presentations and pictures, so you won't have to read too much, and I can go as quickly or slowly as I want. Um, I do appreciate being here this weekend. Um, I've learned lots of things. Uh, I learned what the word quantum means, I think. Uh, there's a lot of quantum things in the world. Um, Dr. Ivey said it permeates our whole society. And this morning I was listening to the news and found out that Michelle Kwan uh, was placed on the Olympic team without trying out. And it has become a quanundrum. So <laughs> uh, then I found out from David Allen that if it weren't for the French, we wouldn't have had a space program. So I, I've learned a lot this weekend. Uh, I did graduate in 82, went on to San Antonio for dental school, uh, practiced general dentistry five years, and went back to Dallas to Baylor and did a residency and then a fellowship at the Cancer Center at MD Anderson. And a, a lot of that is what you will see today. Uh, the specialty of prosthodontics uh, as a dental specialty is not real well known. Most people say, what's that? Um, and maxillofacial prosthetics is like a subgroup of that. And this is not something I personally do every day. There are a few institutions in the United States where they do it every day on a regular basis, and Anderson being one of those. But I do uh, quite a bit more of this than I thought I would. Um, I'm also going to, show, going to show an introduction on some of the more current uses for dental implants and their use in reconstructive process. So I work with a lot of other physicians. Uh, I work with a lot of other dentists and specialists. Uh, this is not unusual for me to follow the radiation oncologist and the surgeon, and then here I am, the dentist. So uh, a lot of times they treat the patient, they cut them up, and then I get them. So um, I am going to dim this just a little more. Hopefully your lunch has settled. I do have some surgery slides. Um, this is a squamous cell carcinoma on the posterior maxilla. Uh, it has been, in this case, I know the image is flipped. I couldn't figure out how to flip it back. Um, they didn't cut the wrong side. Okay. Uh, don't even ask. Okay. Um, so this is a maxillectomy procedure uh, typically done by head and neck surgeons. Uh, hopefully, and then the patient has had radiation therapy for this type of cancer typically, uh, and then ultimately the surgery uh, defect heals, the radiation effects heal, and then eventually the patient needs some type of rehabilitation, and this is done much more effectively prosthetically than it is surgically, however it can be done surgically in some cases. Um, and I hope to show you what type of uh, end results we can achieve prosthetically, although functionally sometimes those don't work as well, they, they definitely provide a service to the patient and give some of the patients a lot of hope that they would not otherwise have. So in a case like this, we make what's called an obturator prosthesis. It's a removable prosthesis. Uh, the patient places this in. It's much like a removable partial. Uh, this portion extending into the defect acts to obturate or close the hole, and therefore the patient can speak, swallow, uh, provide normal daily functions, and uh, it gives the, the patient just something very functionally. This is a fairly, uh, in this realm, a fairly simple uh, approach, but a very effective approach approach when the patient has this taken out, uh, the, the defect area is much more accessible for visualization for any recurrence and problems that may be going on. If you close this with a tissue flap, uh, the patient has to undergo CT or some type of scanning uh, just to determine if there's any recurrence. So this is uh, typically done well. Uh, we also work on patients who need facial prosthetics, not just intraoral, but extraoral. And so this is a patient who lost an eye due to a, a, a cancer and some of his uh, mid-nasal region. Uh, I can't go through all the steps for this, but just real quickly, 
uh, frequently we try to make some type of substructure that is the base or the foundation for the external prosthesis. Uh, this is all handmade and a series of impressions, laboratory procedures, uh, multiple <coughs> impressions. Uh, these are magnets, samarium cobalt magnets that are placed uh, onto the prosthesis that is the substructure. This prosthesis, we also, I have had a lot of training in dental and other materials and because the material science that we have to use on, on patients is influenced by a lot of different things but this particular type of acrylic uh, plastic is a, a thermoplastic when it's heated it can be manipulated and shrunk and then as it goes in and comes back to room temperature or body temperature in this case it gets rigid again. So the patient can actually put it in and it acts to retain the external prosthesis. Uh, next is what many of us know uh, as a glass eye. It's actually an acrylic eye. It's called the ocular. Orbital is when you have more than just your eyeball gone. So the eyeball itself is called the ocular. This other prosthetic component is called the orbital. Uh, positioning the ocular is the hardest part because three-dimensionally it has to be positioned uh, symmetric to the other eye and you, it doesn't move obviously it's not functional but we have to pick a point so what we do is we sit down with the patient across the table and we use a conversational gaze is what it's called so if they're talking with somebody the other person is comfortable a lot of this treatment is for their family and everybody else who's looking at them Okay. It's not always just for the patient. Matter of fact, half of these patients are brought in by their family, especially the older men. I don't care if I don't have an eye or a nose or an ear, you know. And the family says, I can't eat and look at you across the table. <laughs> so. so it makes dinner time much more appetizing. Um, we go through a series of, once we have determined the position for the ocular, uh, we go through a series of very artistic sculpting to come up with the final shape of the prosthesis. Uh, we go through a series of impressions and mold making to turn that into a medical grade silicone. We typically, there's two ways to do this. You do all the color when you process the silicone or you do the color secondarily. My preference is secondarily, but it doesn't really matter. Um, if you do it secondarily, then the color of the initial prosthesis, and I'm sorry, but the color here is a lot better. I'm sure you can all see it. Um, but the color is the lightest skin shade that the patient has. And if any of you are artists and work with that much, it's a lot easier to make it a little darker than it is to make it a little lighter. So we can tone down the value. So we pick the, the highest value that, that we can. Now this is the prosthesis. This shows the shell that was into the socket uh, with the eye on it from the side view. Um, so this is like all together. This is the two pieces. You can see counter magnets. This portion over here is all uh, silicone. It has a urethane liner, much like a very thin sandwich bag because that will last and wear a long time. These patients take these on and off every day or every two days to clean them and clean things out. The magnets will be retained with the counter magnets that are in the other prosthesis. The ocular itself sits in there, um, but you can peel the eyelids open and take it out so it's actually not connected chemically or in any other way, it's just mechanically held in. So once you end up with a prosthesis, you do the extrinsic coloring uh, and it's put into place. Um, we use all the camouflage techniques we can. So these patients are always told to wear glasses. Number one, the, the glasses help camouflage the prosthesis. The glasses help protect the other eye. So they're told to get protective lenses because they have one eye that's functional. And you want to do everything you can to protect it. Also, if the patient gets knocked, bumped, or in a car wreck, and their prosthesis tries to fall out, the glasses help hold it in. So they actually serve several very good functions as well as making it hard to tell they have a prosthesis. So that's the eye. We can do the same thing with the ear, another extra oral prosthesis. Patient lost an ear. He has somewhat of an ear canal. 
this was to basal cell carcinoma. So we can go through the same molding process, make the ear, color it, and then we also add facial hair. Typically we get that from theatrical stores. Theatrical stores usually have real human hair and they order it from usually South Korea or the Philippines where someone actually uses a microscope and ties individual hairs on, the, on these little uh, hair prosthetics. So it's pretty cool. So we can make an auricular prosthesis. We can put hairs on it. We can custom make them to mold and guide. In this case, rather than retained by magnets, it's retained on a daily basis by some adhesive. And that's our least optimal way to retain a prosthesis because over time it tends to wear out faster. At that time, the patient underwent his radiation therapy treatments, and so that's why you see the, the skin, the sunburn, and the, uh, the markings over here. And then we elected to use a fibula graft from the leg to bring up bone and anastomose it into the mid-face region of the cheek. Uh, and this was accomplished here, wrapping it with, uh, with the muscles and the tissues in that region as well as the skin. After that, we used these, uh, these craniofacial dental implants in the region. Three of these are facing out and three of these are facing down into the oral cavity. Uh, the primary planning on this was to position the bone graft and the tissue in, in such a way that it left us room for prosthetics. We didn't want it interfering if possible. We fabricated an, an upper denture, kind of a hybrid prosthesis that is retained. The patient can take this in and out uh, with these O-ring type ball and, ball and socket mechanism. And then facially, we use the same thing. A lot of times the skin gets real irritated. They have to have revision surgeries to thin it out uh, and they have to really work to keep it clean. But once his facial prosthetics are done, uh, the nose and cheek prosthetic snaps on, his dentures snap in, so everything has good stability and retention and he can function on that. Um, not as well as obviously if this had never occurred, but he can function, he can live in society, he owns a furniture business, so now he can go places and talk to people and do things. Um, getting back into the mouth a little bit, uh, this patient has some rampant periodontal disease problems, losing teeth, and this is kind of the current state of the art before the next state of the art that I'm going to show you right after this, where someone is going to lose all their teeth, they don't want removable dentures, and so we can place dental implants and we can do this whole procedure basically in one day so that they don't have to go through multiple surgeries, multiple healing phases, and multiple times either without any teeth or dentition uh, or having to wear something that's removable. Uh, this is kind of the way you do it without a computer. So I'm gonna run through that real quick and then the last case I'm gonna show you is how you do this type of case with a computer. So in the laboratory, we fabricate a denture from the models kind of the old-fashioned way. We cut the teeth off as if the patient just had surgery. We fabricate denture and then we duplicate this into a guide stent that's an exact replica of that denture. And this is our handmade guide for placing implants. The locations of the teeth have these guide holes drilled through them or grooves so that at the time of surgery, we can remove the patient's teeth, place this in the mouth. We know where the teeth should be that we're gonna end up with, and we can place implants in those positions. So here we go. The patient's ready, we take all the teeth out, we have these sockets, we have the bone, and we would like to put the implants in those socket positions and then graft if we need to uh, for any extra spaces. So we place our stent and we place our implants, and so now the patient has had his teeth removed utilizing the guide stent that was fabricated in a laboratory, um, we placed the implants, and now we're going to use those, this is also all the same day, to place these 
screwed on abutments, we call them, that will connect the new teeth to the implants in this position. And that's kind of always been the problem. We could always do planning. We've had computer planning for 10 or 15 years, but taking that computer plan from a laptop to surgery accurately has always been a problem. And so this is the way you do it when you can't do it by computer. So now we're going to make impressions of this the same day. We're going to use those abutments. We're going to put them into the denture. These are screws. And we line everything up. We make holes in that denture where these implants are because before the surgery, we weren't exactly sure where they would end up. And when I say where they're going to end up, the prosthetics that are placed on dental implants should be within 100 microns of the exact position. So there's very little room for error. They say it has to have a passive fit, and that's what they mean by a passive fit, usually less than 100 microns. Um, so in the mouth, we reline this with material so all those connectors get attached to the denture. And because we are doing this in the patient in the exact position, that's how we know everything's in the proper position. So I hope you all are picking up on this. So now we take that denture into the laboratory. We cut out the palate. We cut off all the excess material. Uh, we have those metal connectors. We unscrewed it from the mouth, kind of did all this on the side. And we have trimmed this down to more of a horseshoe-shaped tooth prosthesis. This is the underside. Uh, we clean it up, polish it, uh, add material, take away material, whatever we need to do. But you can see the six connectors. And now we can go back in to the patient, chair side, screw this back into place, put little uh, material over the screw holes. We can still get back to it and unscrew it. But now the patient, the same day of surgery, has a full arch of teeth. He lost teeth, he got implants, and he got new teeth in the same day. It took about eight hours, and it's all done essentially by hand. Um, so here's our patient, here's our implants. He still has his lower teeth, there's a few problems down there, um, but basically this is kind of his new maxilla uh, full arch support. So he's ready to go home, he's doing good, <laughs> but uh, he was actually good after the drugs wore off, too. So, um, okay, last thing here I'm going to run through. The, um, the radiographic guide, we use a CT much like uh, you saw earlier uh, that Dave was showing. And we use that. We use the DICOM files. We extrapolate that into a computer software program. So I'm going to run through that real quick. Now, we still have to make the preliminary denture, and this is on someone who has already lost their teeth. So this is the shortcoming because the patient typically has to have already lost their teeth. Uh, but we're going to go back and still do the implants and place everything kind of the same day. So the patient gets the CT scan at this point uh, with a guide. And then we put the guide through the scan by itself because we have placed markers in there. And so whether it's a denture or it's some fabricated uh, because we're only doing a certain number of teeth and not the whole arch. But we place these little markers. And if you look, oops, we use what's called gutta percha, which is just a radiopaque rubberized material, same thing that we fill root canal teeth with. And because uh, if you take an x-ray, there's enough radiopacity that it's picked up. Uh, but what happens in the software program is that is mated to the splint when the patient had it in their mouth and it, it places it over the bone in the same position. Um, so this would be like the patient wearing the denture. This is where we want the implant to be planned. And what we're making here, the computer will actually, we will plan the placement and then we will have these um, drill guides placed into a guide stent. So unlike the plastic guide stent you saw where we just cut holes in it where the teeth were, 
we actually do all of this planning on the computer and then the computer uses a CAD CAM process and a machine actually mills out the guide stent. So rather than us making it in a laboratory, a machine makes it based on the position that we want the final implants to be and this is the guide sleeve that kind of everything goes through and guides the position. So the patient goes through, has the CT scan. Um, we actually have some uh, CAT scanning machines, uh, one's called an iCAT, there, there's several, but it's a cone beam CT and uh, it's much smaller than this. It can be in a doctor's office and, uh, but then we scan the denture or the stent by itself and this will be mated in the software program over the bone. So we take this, we put it into the software program, so we fill this out and it's just a one, two, three, it's, it's a really good, there's several programs but this is probably one of the best out there and it's a one, two, three step. Uh, the DICOM files come in and the patient's hard tissue structures uh, come into this program and we can manipulate this in three dimensions. So we can look at X, Y, and Z axis, we can rotate it, we, we can do whatever we want and then we can select, and this is probably the main slide to look at, because here you see the bone, this blue thing is the, the denture or the prosthesis, and we can just hit a button and that disappears or comes back. We can flip this all around and these pins on the outside are just for surgery. So we put this stent into place, there's nothing to stabilize it. So we use these pins surgically at the time to hold it on the bone so it won't move and then we place our implants, in this case one, two, three, four, five, six implants and we can look through these axial uh, slices, any slice we want to see in relationship to the bone where is this implant. We can pick any size, any diameter, anything that's available uh, we can place that. You can stay away from the sinuses, the mandibular nerve, all the vital structures you can see and avoid as you do your planning. Uh, at that point, after your planning is done, that goes into a queue and actually this company that makes the guide stent with their computerized milling machine also sends all the implants and components and pieces needed for the surgery if you need it. So you kind of get surgery in a box, comes in UPS, you know. Um, so you can go through and fill that out. One of the neat things about this is we just did a very, very accurate within 100 microns planning of the placement of implants in a patient in a full arch and if we know where those are in the computer and we know where we want the teeth to be, we can actually take the next step and make the teeth. And so that's what this does. We also use a CAD CAM process to scan and mill and make a metal framework of, of where we want the teeth to be because this is the part that's inside the teeth that's held on to the implants. So in the laboratory, we still use, there it is, uh, conventional process in the laboratory to put the teeth back on there uh, but but these are placed over that computer milled titanium structure. The implants are titanium and the milled bar underneath is titanium. So now before we've done any surgery on the patient we have all of the implants, we know where they're going to be, we have a guide stent and we, we have the teeth that will go on at that time. The actual surgery is usually one hour and it's kind of cookbook stuff. All the work is done ahead of time. So at this point, you get something back. These are diagrams similar to this. Uh, these are where the guide pins go. Uh, the patient, there's been a bite record made so the patient can bite and these are in place. But you can see these are the six channels where those implants will go. Yes. So, all of them. Um, there's a series of drills, we won't go into the details, but
basically you start with a small hole, a larger hole, until you get to the size of the implant you're placing. You place the implant, everything goes through these sleeves, it's all guided. Really the only variable, there's a slight variable on the depth, but there's also a, a depth guide. But that's probably the one axis that we have the least control over. And so there's a special abutment that accommodates a little bit of difference in depth. Uh, so when you're done, you can actually place permanent final teeth, and there's a company who's actually trademarked teeth in an hour. And, uh, or you can temporarily make some very good teeth that go on, let everything heal, make sure there's not problems with healing or other problems that can be associated with this, because it is pretty advanced complex therapy, and then finish it later. Uh, but basically the patient is treated and restored in a very short amount of time and restored back to normal function. Most of these patients can get up and go to work tomorrow, no problem. Uh, I have one last thing to show you. And the question is, why go through all this? And the answer is, ask grandma. <laughs> <laughs>